Hoo ha too ha! I'm back, I'm black, and I'm madder than a heart attack. Welcome, everyone, to Happy Harry's Who Ha To How To's Episode 4, in fact. A New Hope. Uh, and what a couple of episodes we've already had. Now, if you remember episode 1, I looked at Flash Basics, which was probably useless to people who do not use Flash. But in episodes 2 and 3, we started to look at character animation and animation in general. How you can use arcs and timing to create uh, nice, aesthetically pleasing movement. And then how you can go about roughing out your own animated little stick men type characters and embellishing them with you know, proper drawing and facial features and everything to make um, a more completed piece of animation. And finally, at the last part of episode three, I ended after we just finished looking at animating a stock take. And that has nothing to do with taking stock of things, but it's the generic surprised reaction that you'll see in almost any cartoon uh, ever made. Now, before I move on to the meat of today's lesson, I'm going to run through some of the stuff that we just started to hit on at the end of last week's episode, which was the breakdown drawing and the in-between drawing and their absolute importance and invaluability if that's a word, um, for you in creating your own animated movement. Now, if you remember, we started off when we animated the take with this sort of bemused-looking character, very roughly drawn here. That was an extreme position, so I'm marking him this an X here. And then uh, he went to this sort of crouched-down position here, which is uh, the anticipation before the action, and we'll talk a little bit more about anticipation, action, and reaction later on. Um, I'm sorry about throwing all of these little buzzwords at you, but it, um, hopefully should all make sense when we're done. And then uh, he jumped up, and we got this uh, sort of more elongated, stretched, surprised face here. Now, uh, if you remember, these are the extreme positions, but what goes in the middle are the breakdowns and in-betweens, and that's what we're going to be looking at. Now, before I get on to breakdowns, which are far more interesting than your straight in-betweens, let's take a look at boring old miserable in-betweens. What makes a good in-between? Well, being able to draw your character or object from any different angle and to know how they work in 3D space is pretty invaluable. To understand why the character or object is moving the way they are and the sort of logic behind the animation, of course, is very useful too. But also I'd argue that just having your brain turned on is a really good place to begin, just to understand exactly why the drawing is the way it is and why it's there. And I'll show you what can happen if you screw that up. Um, let's say that we have just a normal old apple and it's falling out of the sky vertically as things that fall out of the sky tend to do. Um, if that's drawing number one and I want one directly below, uh, we can make that drawing number two or drawing number three rather in this instance because we're going to put another one in the middle and if I wanted a direct in between or a straight in between it would be somewhere about there pretty much smack bang in the middle occasionally um, you can favor a drawing before or after and that's the terminology you just say I want it to favor drawing number one or I want it to favor drawing number three so if I ever use that phrase again you'll know what I'm talking about and that of course means um, it's closer to one or the other drawing and then that is no longer a straight in between because it's not directly in between the two positions but it's pretty easy to draw horizontal or vertical in-betweens. An object just moving up or down or left and right is fairly easy to wrap your head around. A far more difficult thing to do is something like a rotation. And there's an excellent example in Richard Williams' book, The Animator Survival Kit, which I have fairly shamelessly thieved here for my own purposes. But to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, we have a pendulum here, the kind of which you would see on a grandfather clock swinging from left to right. 
or from right to left. I'm not going to be a purist about that. Now, um, of course, the middle position for our two extreme positions here would see the pendulum end up somewhere around here. And I just copied and pasted that with the pendulum itself dipping in the middle as it swings. But in this particular instance that Richard gives in his book, I'm calling him Richard like I know him, uh, the particular example that Richard Williams gives in his book, The Animator Survival Kit, which is such a great book, I'm sorry I'll stop nerding out about that. Uh, in the particular example, he says that the in-betweener placed the pendulum directly between the left and right extreme positions, which would mean that the sort of neck or the long thin part of the pendulum has to shrink dramatically for that to work which is of course totally wrong and we could envision that working with a character for example if someone is waving to a friend and we have their arm sort of pivoting between these two positions like so the middle position would actually see the hand higher up than the left or right position otherwise the hand would of course or the arm rather would have shrunk in the process of the animation and that kind of thing can become pretty rampant if you're not keeping an eye on what you're doing now often on projects that have more than one animator labor is divided up by having a lead animator draw the extreme positions and often the breakdowns as well and then one or more people come along and do the in-betweens which can cause problems because you can have bad communication or people not really understanding or having different ideas about how characters and objects should be drawn and just not understanding where the thing is supposed to be going and I'll give you an idea of how that can be problematic. Here we have two drawings of a very simple character giving a very simple head turn. And if I draw a direct in-between smack bang in the middle of these two drawings, we'll still involve a little bit of 3D movement because the head is turning. Now, I'm going to do this very roughly and very quickly, but we want the head to be somewhere about there. Let's lean that up a little bit. And the nose will be about here and one eye will be completely visible but the other eye is just beginning to disappear as the head turns and we want a sort of three quarters view on that ear there and the other ear will pretty much be disappearing as well and the mouth will just begin to become obscured as it rotates sort of apply to the head and that's a character with a very simple 3d structure um, it's almost just a sphere with a bulbous nose sticking out and two ears and that as an in-between would work but it would be very easy for someone who doesn't quite understand the 3d makeup of the character or who doesn't understand how the character works in general to i don't know maybe uh put the head in the right place but not really understand how one eye disappears so we get two completely visible eyes that stick out of the head and the nose uh, maybe still remains smack bang in the middle as opposed to actually beginning to stick out the side of the head that wouldn't look particularly good maybe they have one ear still entirely visible and this ear here stays locked onto the side of the head and then you know you can imagine where we'd go with that we just have a rubbish in between which would be problematic a very good way to keep people on target by the way if you are working with multiple animators is of course to produce something called a turnaround and i have an example here this is actually a very limited turnaround because i've only produced profile and front on images uh, with this turnaround but i produced more art on top of this to keep animators on track and uh, this is actually for a project called Starbarians, which I only seem to put out one episode for once every Mayan calendar. But I am working on more. And uh, that will help keep people on target so we don't end up with this.
I need to give you guys a quick lesson on the difference between pose to pose animation and full animation. Now sadly I cannot show you any examples of proper full animation for copyright reasons because um, it's not the kind of animation I do and the only sort of examples that I can think of are in maybe a CGI DreamWorks film or a Pixar film or a classic 2D uh, Disney film, the kind they don't make anymore, or a really big budget cutscene from a big game. Um, it's full animation because the characters hardly ever stop moving. They're constantly, you know, getting up and moving and walking around and striking poses and emoting, and they're only going to stop moving maybe to let another character deliver a line or if they're in the background or something. And I'm going to take a wild speculatory guess and say that, like me, you're probably going to be sticking with pose to pose, which is uh, often what indie animators do or people working in TV, where the budgets are a little tighter and the manpower is uh, somewhat less. Now, pose to pose animation I can show you an example of, and here I've found um, a clip of an old animation I sadly will not be finishing, but it's of a spoilt teenage girl. Okay, I don't know if you heard that, um, but she said, if only my life could be more like Twilight. And I, I totally feel her on that, poor thing. But uh, as you can see, I'll just turn off the audio here. She moves up, stops, turns, stops, and then goes back down and stops. Sorry, I'll let that play again one more time without interrupting it. As you can see, um, the animation's pretty fluid, but it does stop. I do uh, keep the character held in some positions with no animation, um, really because I'm an indie and I have to do that so that I can get my things done and out there with something resembling uh, frequency. Um, as it happens, I, I, I don't put out a whole lot of stuff, but it, you know, it's because that's animation and it takes a long time and it takes even longer if you do full animation. And that's why I'm going to be sticking with pose to pose, at least for the time being. Okay. So we have three frames at our disposal. I've talked about this before. We have the extreme frames. We have the breakdown frames and we have the straight in between frames, which we've already looked at today. And I don't have a whole lot to say about extremes other than the fact that they should usually come first when you're plotting out your action. Or animation and uh, a general rule I think to help you tell what is an extreme as opposed to a breakdown or um, an in-between is the direction that the character is moving and the point at which they stop and begin to move in another direction. Now this character has a very bland movement here he's simply just rocking forward. I've drawn two extremes and I've put a straight in between in there and it gives us a really bland little piece of animation hardly even animation I'd call it however if we decide to add in a few more straight in betweens we get a somewhat nicer to look at movement but it's still flipping boring now I've jazzed that up a little bit and I've done this hopefully to show you that you can create nicer animation by just being smarter and a little bit more adventurous with your extreme positions if we go to the next file here, we see that I've got the character going down before he goes back up. But these are all still extreme positions. Why? Well, because when the character moves down, he doesn't move any further down than this point. He starts up here, and then he moves down. The next drawing will not be the character moving even further down and even further down, because instead, he's starting now to find his next extreme position, which is this height here. Now we might decide that we actually do want another extreme position. We might want the character to go up before he goes back down. And this is typically called overshoot. It's when the character has moved too far in the direction they were traveling and then has to settle back into a final position. We can also uh, bring that back to something that I've mentioned earlier called the anticipation action and reaction of a movement which we will eventually look at in more detail and it's sort of the last part of uh, conceptualizing animated movements. But these are our three extremes. Now you can do anything with your extremes really even though we just want the character to move from this position to this position by putting this down position in the middle we've created a much more interesting looking movement he's got his eyes shut his expression has changed his eyebrows have uh, 
drooped slightly, and it's just more entertaining to look at. I've got another variation here of the character actually moving up before he moves down. It's still an extreme, because I won't continue to move him up, he's going to change position there. But it's still more interesting to look at than that original vanilla motion of him simply sliding from one position to the next. Here's another attempt at the character actually drawing back before he moves forward. So we have a slightly different variation there. And I've given us another one here of the character moving forward before he moves back. So to basically summarize, an extreme is the point in which the character has reached the furthest point in the direction that they were traveling and begun to change direction to go somewhere else or to stop. So it's either a point at which the character has stopped moving or changed direction. That's how I like to think about it. It is starting to dawn on me now that I think I've given you last week's lesson just in more detail. Uh, but it's difficult for me to not do that because I really want to, to stress to you how important learning these fundamental mechanics are. Uh, and the nice thing is that once you learn them, you can kind of forget them and they become second nature to you. And you can just worry about creating animation and making it look great and feel great and not have to be bogged down with thinking, oh, you know, is this an extreme drawing? Is this an in-between? How many in-betweens do I need? Is the timing right? Uh, do I have an arc going there? All that kind of stuff. So the last thing we're going to look at today, again, we did touch on it last week, but now we can go into a little bit more detail, is the breakdown drawing. And as a sort of precursor to what we're going to look at next week, which is beginning to finally look at uh, action animation and character or sort of human locomotion like running and punching and stuff we've got a character here giving an uppercut okay so I've drawn four extreme drawings him in a sort of starting position him going down then him overshooting slightly now you could just throw in between drawings in between these extremes uh, and that wouldn't look too awful in fact we kinda know what that would look like if I drew an in between here we can see his head is sort of rotating downwards, so I'd probably draw the head around about here, starting to rotate almost actually completely level, um, with the eyes half shut because they're open in the first extreme and they're closed in the second, and I give him a little nose, and I'd have the hand about halfway, etc, etc. But a breakdown, what that will do is, it's still an in-between drawing, because it's still the character in motion. They haven't reached an extreme position where they will change direction or stop moving altogether. But it's a way of kind of splitting the character into parts and beginning to think about what we looked at back in episode 2, which is the hierarchy of movement and which bits sort of become delayed and which bits move first. And I'm going to say that he's got a pretty heavy head. So if he has a heavy head, that's actually going to take its time to move. So I'm going to put that closer to the first position. So the head is favoring the first extreme, even though the rest of the body will not be. And I'm going to have his eyes basically still open. And I'm going to say his fist is weighty too, because he's got kind of scrawny arms but a big fist. So I'm going to have that fist favor that too. But I think his body and his uh, his waist is sort of driving the movement and pulling him. So I'm going to put that body almost smack dab in the middle of the uh, first extreme and the second extreme. And you can see we're not really creating a direct in-between. Again, I'm actually going to make this, um, this fist here on the other hand heavy, so it's still going to be greatly favoring that first position. And this is a breakdown because we've effectively kind of sectioned off the head, the fists, and the body, and we're moving them at different speeds. It's not just a direct, unthinking in-between. Now, if we wanted another breakdown to appear before the character comes back up with its punch, um, I'm going to say here that maybe the fist is really dragging here, but his shoulder, which is kind of dr driving the movement here, is really high up and if the shoulders high up and we're making the shoulder drive the movement then the shoulder probably will have pulled the head up most of the way so the head here is almost a straight in between 
But what we do is by giving this delay here on the fist, by giving this breakdown a real heavy kind of drag on the hand, is I think we'll actually exaggerate the um, the impact of the punch when it does come up. And I'm going to put the other hand here pretty much in the middle again. So that's not really doing too much that's unique in terms of breakdown. And we're probably going to want another drawing here, but I'm going to say we could almost get away with just doing it on a one. And please refer to um, episode one or two, I believe, is where we look at the difference between animating on ones and animating on twos, and how we can combine them to get the boast, the, the boast of worth worlds. Blimey, I think I did an Alan Partridge there. The best of both worlds. Um, so we want the hand to be sort of midway here and really kind of maybe we, we could warp it and stretch it and again that's something that we'll look at in later episodes and here with the hand finally sort of reaching out and punching up I probably won't do any breakdowns after that I'd probably just do a couple of in-betweens to have it ease back into position because he sort of slightly overshot the punch so we've put a bit of overshoot in there. So let's just take a quick look at that a few times. Okay, uh, it's not quite ready yet. As I, as you can see, the breakdowns are fairly rough. And I need a few more in-betweens. I'll probably put an in-between after this extreme and between this breakdown. Probably put an in-between here after the first breakdown and the extreme. And now let's get that animated. Okay, so here we have the rendered out animation of the character with an apparently very heavy lead weight of a fist giving a pretty fearsome looking punch and let's look at how we got there. We started off with our extreme um, and then I drew uh, an in-between going through our first breakdown, another in-between smoothing into our extreme and then putting the following few frames on ones, had another in-between going to this break down here, another in between, and then finally going back to twos, our extreme, and then two in betweens easing into our last extreme. And that together gives us a pretty good little bit of animation. And if we want to go back and look at what we examined in episode two, we can turn on our onion skin, and it makes it much easier then to effectively trace the arcs and see the arc that that fist makes, something like that. And uh, that sort of should bring together everything we've looked at so far. Our timing, our spacing, our drawing of characters, roughing them out, and then cleaning them up to create extremes, breakdowns, and in-betweens. And I think that finally we're ready to look at some real animation to really wrench the guts out of uh, the the kind of stuff we want to do that that sounds a little bit psychopathic and get to grips um, with creating completed scenes and movements and really get on with making our film so join me next week for more happy Harry's hoo-ha to how to's terror happy Harry's hoo-ha